Welcome to another episode of Legends of Motorsport. With me today, rallying legend Rod Millen. Rod, I'm going to start with the simplest of questions. You're a North Shore lad. To me, that usually means surfing, sailing, girls. It doesn't usually mean cars. You know, that's you're correct. And as a teenager, I started out sailing and surfing. Right. You know that. We were close by the beach. You know, prior to that, we'd, we'd been brought up on a farm on Dairy Flat. We were now living by the beach, so, you know, you need to get a surfboard. So you work all, all summer and um, save up for that. And, uh, and as soon as you got your driver's license, you know, the surfboard strapped on the car and off you go. So how did you get from surfing into racing cars or rallying cars or hill climbing? Well, I think what, what, what happened was the, uh, the surfing adventure, certainly in New Zealand, um, on the North Island, you know, when it was onshore on one coast, the waves were better typically on the other coast and vice versa. So you end up driving from coast to coast, which is only an hour in most cases. A lot of those times in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, they were all gravel roads. And... Um, before you realise that you know that the balance of that was required in surfing was also required in driving fast on a gravel road, sliding the car around the corners. And to me, it was doing that was just as exciting, perhaps even more exciting than than surfing. So um, you know that was how that all all evolved. Back in those days, it was a pretty exciting sort of club scene, wasn't it? There was a lot of Hill climbing, in fact, you know, I was involved with the University Car Club and our, our, our climb, basically you owned it, you owned Anderson's farm in that beach buggy, didn't you? Yeah, you know, it was, it was close by. Um, and I think, I think in those days to, to get your racing license, you had to do three gravel hill climbs. Right. Um, and you had to do a club race um, being observed. I, I remember three stripes had to be on the back of the car That's it. And, you know, and then you could go and do a national event and I think you did two or three of those events and then you could do an international event. But it all started out at the gravel hill climbs. Um, that's what got me going uh, into motorsports and I really enjoyed it. So yes, I ventured off into these other things but I always stayed doing the hill climbs. And you know, in the in the Auckland region, golly, there must have been six different car clubs, which I think I belonged to each one of them. And there was it was nothing for me to do a hill climb on a Saturday and a hill climb on a Sunday. I remember one day I did two different hill climbs on a Sunday and one on a Saturday, and one all three. Um, so, <laughs> you know, the the old beach buggy that that was built. Um, and it's being restored, the original one, my brother-in-law is restoring, it's nearly finished right now. Um, it's all going back to the same spec as when I raced it. Um, its power to weight ratio was great, only had 160 horsepower, but, but the thing must have lay, weighed you know, 1,200 pounds. You know, the, the engine was mid-mounted, pretty crude in those days, but effective. And uh, it worked well at hill climbs, you know, we, we set records everywhere and it was just, I don't know, it was, a, it was a wonderful time in motorsports and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Did the, I mean the beach buggy, a lot of people may not know, but you know, the Sam Pacer beach buggy with the V6 in it, did that sort of set you on a path of doing your own thing if you like, not doing what everybody else had done, you know, say like buying an Anglia or a Mini or whatever, yeah. you, you wanted to do your own thing? You know, it, looking back on it, yes, it clearly did. And, and it felt by being, doing my own thing, you know, a lot of it was driven by cost. You know, it, the, the, the motor was pretty stock. Yes, it got a bit of a cam and it got, you know, the carburetor tweaked on and the heads planed a little bit and, and uh, it was made to go a little faster. I think we burned through seven gearboxes on that thing. Um, <laughs> they were all production gearboxes. But I was able to go racing. You know, I could go hill climbing, I could go club racing, I could do a lot of things. We even took it to Western Springs one night, you know. So there was lots of things I could do with it. And, you know, I sold that machine in 74 to buy my rally car for $1,500. So it was not an expensive machine, but I got a lot of seat time, a lot of experience, a lot of learning that I 
you know, that was perhaps my stepping stone to go into other things. And it was different. It, it made you stand out. People would have noticed you because of that car. Yeah, and perhaps I didn't realize that at the time. It was, it was you know, of course, you know, I had a full-time job uh, surveying, and it was about doing as much as I could with it. And uh, it was cheap. It was really cheap motorsports. Um, and, and as I said, lots of seat time. So it, it got me a lot of that experience. And, and along the way, you know, even when I went and did some of the club races and that, I, I found that, you know, when the conditions, like when it rained, I was often very successful. When it was dry and, fa and fast, you know, then the sporty cars, they were faster than me, you know. So I quickly realized that, you know, I was better attuned to running on a inferior surface. Um, and I could use the machine and myself as I was gaining more and more experience uh, to get better results. Your timing couldn't have been better really, could it? Because, you know, just when you were realizing this was when rallying properly or special stage rallying in New Zealand started to take off. Exactly, and um, you know, it was that the last six months or so when I was running the beach buggy, I did the Maramura Forest Club Rally, I did the Woodhill Rally, and, and I won those against the, the factory Ford Escorts. And then Motorsport New Zealand came down on me like a ton of bricks and banned the machine, um, which, you know, at the time had me pretty disappointed. Mm -hmm. uh, they banned it on, a, on the safety, but the reality was it was not a good image to have no. this cheap old beach buggy out there, you know, beating, you know, highly sophisticated European rally cars. You know, before I knew it, it pushed me in a different direction. Yes, I love the rallying and that, and, and I could sort of see that you know, with the right machine I could be successful, but there was no way could I afford one of those European Ford Escorts. So, um, so how, what did you do? How did you solve the problem? So a good friend of mine, um, he just bought his, his wife the Mazda RX-3, and he said, let's do the eight-day heat way rally. <laughs> yep. and, and off we went, you know, he convinced his wife that, you know, we'll bring that car back just like it was new. Um, so off we went and put a, a roll cage in it and put some suspension components in it. And we went and entered the production class, started out of Christchurch. Um, eight days, I rolled it twice, rolled it on the house pass on snow and ice one night, stood it up and... Um, finished the stage, even passed the three cars that had passed me while I was upside down, um, including my brother, <laughs> and, uh, and we ended up fifth overall um, against all the factory cars ahead of us and first in production class. And you could say that there gave us the, the recognition um, for certainly Mazda in New Zealand to come on board and uh, support a full rally program in 74. Rallying was, was so different then, I was looking back, you know, you talk about eight day rallies and the Heatway Rally of that time, you know, 5,000 kilometres yeah. in total, you know, 2,800 kilometres of special and yeah. stages that were 160 k's long. Yeah, yeah. Just must have been a totally yeah. alien world to be in. Compared to today, yeah. yeah. But it, that was the norm, you know, and through the, in the winter, um, you know, snow and ice and, yep. and, you know, for a North Island guy that he didn't have a lot of knowledge and experience <laughs> on that, quickly learnt what to do and what not to do. It's funny, the other day I was just driving and as f things come back to you, um, you know, you would race all night long and, you know, as a kid I was always told to eat my carrots, you know, <laughs> because that's good for your eyesight at night time, yep. you know. Well, I remember racing through some of these roads at night time and the carrots rolling around on the floor <laughs> underneath my feet and these goddamn carrots are always getting in the way. But I ate my carrots all the time. And you it know. sure paid off. <laughs> well, I don't know whether it paid off or not. I was just changed, following some good advice, I thought. Well, it, 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 it pretty much paid off because you were New Zealand Rally Champion 75, 76, 77. That's quite an achievement, isn't it? Yeah, I was pretty thrilled about that, and you know, I, once again, you know, you, you reflect on that at, at, the, at the time. I, you know, I was not, initially in 75, I was not the fastest guy, but I kept finishing. I had to finish. I couldn't afford to crash. I didn't have the budget for that. Um, so, you know, the goal was to, to finish, and 
in doing so, we won the championship, but we weren't the fastest guy. Um, but looking back on it, I got more seat time than anybody else. And 76, um, we started, the car got faster. You know, we started knocking on the doors of the faster guys as well. We were sort of matching stage times, but we were still always finishing every event, won the championship that year. And in 77, we were actually faster than the other guys. Um, not that the machine was maybe faster, but I had more experience, more confidence and so on. And, you know, certainly in the sport of rallying, you know, that seat time, you know, hours, hundreds of hours of sitting behind the wheel, experiencing all sorts of conditions. You know, in those days, there was, it was all secret roads. We didn't know those roads. Right. So you had to drive, you know, with uh, a bit up your sleeve to catch it when, <laughs> when you misread the corner, you know. So um, um, there was certainly great days. Did that, you know, philosophy of because you, in those early days, you had to finish to keep because you couldn't afford to fix the car. Did, do you think that that stayed with you, that finishing is important, that, you know, steady but sure wins the race? Did that stay with you? It did. For the most part, it did. You know, um, my big thing, I think, in those early days, it, it showed me how important for my career, my future career, was to win a championship. It was more important to win a championship than a, a particular event. Um, so that's, that's what I chose to do. And I loved racing and adding the points as I went, you know, plus or minus on how is this gonna work out? You know, what do I need to do to, to make this work? Didn't always get it 100% right, but most of the time I did. And, um, <clears throat> you know, even when I moved to the U.S., championships were really important um, uh, because that's, that's what got you to the next year. During that time, it was pretty dominant to win three championships, you know, or win three times. When did you start to think, hey, I might want to do this, you know, I'd like to perhaps, is it possible to make a living out of this? Do I still have to be a surveyor or can I actually make a living out of it? It wasn't until the um, end of mid mid seventy seven, I think it was. You know, I'd I'd been and done the Southern Cross Rally a couple of times with with the the RX three. Um, showed showed times. You know, we had good speed, but the car was not suitable for the rough course over there. Um, you know, we'd taken it to England and did the RAC Rally. Um, that was an eye-opener. There was, once again, a lot of terrain experience that I didn't know about. Um, and uh, I don't think the car was suitable for those, those conditions over there. You know, I think we had tuned it more for the New Zealand roads, which were faster flowing roads. Yep. The, the British roads, the, the British forests were, were more narrow logging tracks. and. Um, engines with torque and not only that but you know experience on those secret british rally roads yeah. was really really important and and uh my re first results here really showed that it was not good you weren't happy about it you know i i knew that it was it was still going to be a hard struggle you know i wanted to explore how i could move from new zealand to chase my my dreams of rallying and so on because in in those days all of your eye, all eyes would have been focused on Europe. I mean, Europe was the home of rallying, wasn't it? Exactly. You know, you know the Fiat team came out here and were, and dominated uh, the Ford Escort, the Chevrolet, and all those cars, all, all from the European side. Um, so, and you know, I I was driving a car that had had no sort of credibility in rallying, um, but you know, that's where my experience was. Um, and, and sort of that's, that's what I kept pushing at. So that, that 77, that RAC, did that put you off going to Europe? You know, it was sort of interesting. Glad I went, glad I went and did that. Um, on the way back, I was invited to, um, to call into the, the Mazda factory in Japan. And um, it was there that um, we, we chatted to the motorsports folks and that. And, they didn't really have a feeling of getting involved with, with rally and that. Um, there, they, they, they pulled me out of the picture and says, this is our next car. And they sort of pulled it out and pulled it away. <laughs> and so well, what's that? They said, this is a new sports car. We're gonna call it the RX-7. 
and we're going to launch it in the United States. Maybe you should consider that. Came back a little seed was sown. Absolutely. Came back to New Zealand with the support of a, the, the the marketing guy from Mazda New Zealand, Bob Bilton. He said, "Absolutely, you know, let's let's explore um, on how you you could go to the U.S." So I went there for six weeks and drove all over the country and met with every organizer to try, just to try to understand um, what the series was all about. And of course, met met with the the Mars and North American folks to explore that possibility. Um, I found that the, the series was very diverse with lots of different conditions, winter <coughs> events, snow and ice events, desert events, forest events, and I really love the American people. So yeah. it made me very welcome, just even, you know, that, that six weeks of driving around. Came back to New Zealand, didn't enter the championship in 78, sold my cars and uh, decided, you know, this is a gamble, I'm going to go to North America. Um, just by accident, I met, met a gentleman from Southern California that wanted to get into the <coughs> port. Um, he wanted to navigate, and uh, um, he owned a Nissan car dealership. So <coughs> I didn't have success of pulling off anything with Mazda there, but he said, come on, let's build a, a Nissan rally car. And that's what we did. And um, we, we built that. You were a professional rally driver. You were living the dream. I sort of was, you know, making no money but having my expenses covered. Um, and that, that's, that's all that mattered. Uh, and uh, built the car, did a whole bunch of rallies, um, won a few events um, against a gentleman <coughs> by the name of John Buffum who was running a TR8 in those days. And, um, and then the, the owner of the car decided, he said, let's get over one of those Ford Escorts from England. There you are in 79, and you're driving the opposition. You yeah. Know? yeah. Finally, you found, that, you found yourself in an Escort. How, diff how were, you, were you disappointed with the Escort? Did you like it? Did you oh, think, I loved oh, it. now I know why they were, you know, those guys were so fast? I love that car. You know, as soon as we got it, we, we were winning virtually all the rallies. Um, so it was easy to drive, well balanced. I was also driving for Nissan Canada and their factory car as well, <coughs> doing their championship. So, <coughs> you know, I think every second weekend I was sitting in, the, in a seat doing lots of events. I just want to go back to a story that's often told uh, from the 77 rally of New Zealand. You know, that was the, the famous Ari Vatan and the, and, the Fiat, and the Fiat rally. And you were the first New Zealand to home, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. But there's a, there's a bit, it's in, it's in the book that, that's been written about you and people talk about it. You had this thing about oiling the door hinges before, the, you know, and I'm sure you did it in front of all the Fiat mechanics, etc. What, where did that come from? You, you know, I think one of the biggest things, and, and this surprised mm -hmm. us, um, the rotary engine was so reliable, it never broke down. You know, and, and there's a few basic things you had to do. You had to make sure you used the factory water radiator and oil cooler. And if you left, kept those temperatures under control and you didn't over rev the engine, the thing just kept running and uh, making good power, you know. And so we didn't touch the motor. So I think it happened once or twice. <laughs> I only have a vague recollection of it. You know, we come into service, we had nothing really to do to the car. We put tires on it and uh, um, somebody got out the oil can and <laughs> decided to oil the hinges. <laughs> uh, that must have impressed the, um, the hard-working Fiat mechanics trying to keep three factory cars going. Yeah. Okay, one other question and then we, we get on to the, the USA. Y you mentioned earlier on in this discussion that, you know, because of circumstances you decided that finishing and championships were important. Right? And, and you can see why it's a very logical choice with wanting to make a career of it. Was there any part of you, though, that thought, I want to be thought of in rallying terms like Ari or, you know, a few years ago, Colin McRae. I want to be the, the balls out merchant. I want to be the fastest guy out there and I want everybody to think of me as the fastest guy out there rather than the guy that wins the championships. No, I don't think so. You, that. Yeah, it, as you were saying that, it, it 
doesn't didn't resonate with me. That was, right. you know, I think I would look at every event as an adventure, <clears throat> um, taking me to places I wouldn't normally go, on some of those back roads, and you know, throughout New Zealand and eventually other parts of the world. I enjoyed that side of it. Um, the, the, the personal satisfaction of putting together a special stage as fast as you could do and keeping it you know, on the road. Sure, you looked up to some of those other folks, Ari Barton and, and those sort of folks on, on what they were doing. Um, and you know, there was times that our stage times were fairly close to them. But um, I think also being realistic in recognizing that you know they've they've got had a whole lot more experience and traveling you know more around the world than I had. So um, and they've got a van full of spare parts. Yeah, that is that as well. And you know, there's quite a few times that you know you could beat some of those better names by being reliable and finishing. So um, perhaps that was the that was the biggest thing that drove me and. And because I was thoroughly enjoying the sport, was making sure I kept in the sport. And so it was more important to be getting slowly better and better and better than taking huge risks and, you know, flaming out. <laughs> yeah, no, that time when you went to the USA, I mean, you won five championships in America. That's mm. a hell of an achievement. And obviously, you know, you had a, a long time rivalry with John Buffum. But those five championships, how important to your career was winning those five championships? In America? Once again, it was a step by step. Um, 79, I don't even remember where we ended up. It must have been second, maybe the same in 1980. And then 81, we dominated, won nearly every rally. Um, with the RX-7 two-wheel drive against John Buffum and the Audi, the Audi front-wheel drive car, not four-wheel drive. Oh, he had a front-wheel drive car. Didn't Initially, it? yes. And then in 82, um, I won the first event and then he showed up with the four-wheel drive car, the factory car. And I ran with him for the first three quarters of that event until he got the hang of it. <laughs> and he blew my doors off for the rest of the season. No matter what we did with that RX-7, we were really lightweight. Um, it just We just could not keep up with the, the Quattro. And um, Mazda North America, um, in, in one of the meetings at the end of the year, I mentioned, I said, you know, I really think we've got to build our own four-wheel drive car. And they just turned around and said to me, they said, well, give us a budget. And you know, I go, uh, <laughs> I've never done that. Now I've done it. <laughs> I've never done that. So, um, um, you know, where we were living in Southern California, there was a, a transmission guy down there by the name of Peter Wiseman from uh, Traction Products and uh, went and chatted to him. He says, yeah, I can do your transmission, a four-wheel drive transmission. You know, he was doing a lot of Formula One stuff then uh, for Brabham. And he, and he says, you know what, he says, I've got quite a bit of knowledge on, on how to do all the front suspension and so on. So um, he helped me a lot in, in designing that car. And um, hmm. looking back on it, it was <laughs> fundamentally, it was there, a little crude. Um, <clears throat> but it, it, was, it started working. The, the first event, we um, went up against the Audi. And we were respectable. Second event, we beat it. So um, we realized then that we were onto something. And I think that's that part of my racing career, to take a, a new four-wheel drive concept and use all our ideas for years of rallying in those days. That was still only, what's this, 83. Um, and designing a car and putting all the mass between the wheels, still getting as light as possible. We still only had 300 horsepower versus the Audi's 450 or so. Um, but once again, we have reliability on our side. We, we did lots of testing and uh, we didn't win the championship against the Audi until 85 right. and won the manufacturer's championship then. Would you say that, you know, that 
summed up how you had always been in a way. You, you, when you were faced with an Audi Quattro, you didn't go and buy an Audi Quattro. No, you went and no. built something to beat it. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, that's been the path yeah. <laughs> my whole career. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, we've I've never been really sort of put off or intimidated by a factory effort over there. It's sort of like. They sit around the table and uh, figure out, you know, how do we make our machine, you know, go head to head against those guys, and uh, and we did, and um, so so that that helped us um, as an organisation. Me as a driver, um, you, you were responsible for your own destiny. Really was, yeah, and um, with that success, you know, we could now start attracting more talent to our organisation um, to go on and do other things as well. Rallying sort of changed towards the end of that year, or the end of you know that time really, didn't it? And started to head down the production-based route, the Group A route. Yeah. And you yeah. headed down there with it, with the, the APRC. How did you get involved in the APRC for Mazda? Well, in, in, in the case of what Mazda were doing, you know, their focus in the U.S. on the RX-7, um, which was a huge success um, um, for them there, was more of the road racing, the IMSA racing. Yeah. Um, you know, I drive for them a couple of times for the teams on the Daytona 24-hour and and some of the other, it, and then they do some production racing. So I drive with their factory teams. Um, but, and you know, so being exposed to that, I could see that's where the bulk of their dollars were going. You know, the RX-7 was a sports car. On the pavement was the focus more than on the dirt. Then along came the Mazda 323 four-wheel drive. And that, they that must have, you know, you must have gone, whoa, it's Christmas. Yes and no. You know, they, they, they came to me, they said, you know what, we need to park the RX-7. And I just built a, a tube frame car. You know, we had evolved, and now I had David Bruns doing the design work. He, you know, he owns Swift Formula cars, and and he'd never done a rally car, but he designed me this, you know, four wheel independent tube frame car from the ground up, and we built it, and it was fantastic. And Mazda told me to park it. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh dear. And so I was actually really disappointed. Um, they said, you've got to get into this production based car, you know, with only, you know, two thirds of horsepower and yep. it's a whole lot heavier, it's front heavy, and, and we're going to promote that. So, you know, of course, that was all part of the Group B cancellation deal and everybody going back to Group A cars. And so, you know, I, I ran that. We, Russia won more championships in the U.S. with that, uh, but then they they also asked me to do. Uh, I did a select a few selected events in Indonesia, or Malaysia, and maybe '88, and then '89. They said, "Okay, we want you to do the whole series." Um, so you know, we went about that, and and over time we learned what we needed to do with the car to make it better. It it. Um, it was still not one of my favourite cars, um, <laughs> and hence I've never kept one of those. <laughs> so, um, but we did win the Asia Pacific Rally Series in '89. You did. So um, can't, can't have been that bad. No, it can't have been that bad. It was sort of it was quite an interesting year. You know, we we'd gone to Daytona 24 Hour driving with one of the the factory teams, and we'd won that. And then Mazda wanted to do Pikes Peak Hill Climb with a four wheel steering MX6, and we won that. And so we were doing the U.S. Rally Series, which was, I don't know, 10 or 12 rounds throughout the country, and doing Asia Pacific. So we had quite a few cars that we were juggling. We were in second place after uh, the, the second to last round, and we weren't intended to go to the India round, um, but we had a chance of winning the championship. So we'd already shipped our cars and vans and everything, which we had two separate programs. Um, back from Australia and back from Malaysia, they all headed back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I had a rally to do up in Michigan, and um, and then India was on a few days later. So fortunately, I still had four cars: two were on the water, two in the U.S. So we were able to fly one to to um, New Delhi and uh, go and finish. We won the U.S. Rally Championship, and then um, head over to to India, which was 
pretty tough event, um, racing in the, the Himalayan mountains at, at uh, the, the end of summer. Probably not rallying as we in New Zealand know it. No, very, very different. Um, you know, was what I call racing in the foothills of the Himalayan mountains, um, which still go up to 10,000 feet. Um, just a, a little bit of snow that we were getting into at that time of the year, but these roads were really, really narrow. And I don't think I've ever had in my pace notes, because now we're getting into pace notes and that, I'd never had the term in my pace notes, do not slide on this corner. <laughs> Because the road was so narrow, just drive around it. <laughs> because if you, if you put a wheel off, that'll be the end of it. <laughs> so that was really a rally where the, the Rod Millen philosophy of get through to the finish paid off. You, you know, and I said to my, my navigator Tony Circum there, um, it, it turned out the roads were so tight and twisty. I really didn't need my pace notes. I could read them, um, and. We only did one pass, and, and you know, it used to be in those days we'd do at least three passes for the notes. We just made the notes, and um, during that time of those three or four days we, we, we had to make the notes, we saw what the, the life was like in India and any facilities and everything else. And I said to Tony before the rally started, I'm going to drive this at my speed. You know, please, please understand that I want to get us home safe. And uh, it turned out that's what we did and still won it by a dozen minutes and um, sort of just held our position throughout the event and uh, made it home with, with no issues at all. It's probably, you know, that's probably, the, you can still probably picture and imagine some of those roads, can't you? That's one of those, I suppose you'd say, history events for you. You've stored it away. I never want to do it again, but I can still remember it to this day. Oh, I saw things there, you know, that, uh, you know, we'd meet trucks sometimes on a special stage and we'd have to back up to find a place that we could <laughs> both pass in a special stage. So you had to drive with all that in mind, you know, so you couldn't guarantee the roads were closed. We were coming through villages at speed, showering the people there, and their houses with rocks. And there was times I said to Tony, I said, you know what? I'm glad I'm the first car through here because I have a feeling we might have pissed some people off here, you know? <laughs> so I wouldn't want to be the second or third car, <laughs> which I heard sometimes was not a good place to be on the road. Okay, well that sort of, you know, pretty much wraps up for a while anyway, your rallying career in the States, but Rob Millen and your enterprises was taken off how did you get into stadium trucks? Hmm. Um, you know, like th that in the in the late eighties, um, Mazda was in the in the in the truck business, and um, they asked me to drive. They had a team doing the the Mickey Thompson off road series, and so they asked me to come in as the third driver um, to do just selected events, and. That worked out pretty good. Um, so you enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. I, I actually loved it. You know, you you. Um, it was at a point in my life where, doing any of the Asia Asia Pacific rounds or the World Championship rounds, you'd be gone for three weeks to do an event. You'd do five thousand miles of practice before the event started. You know, just or doing your pace notes and that. The Mickey Thompson series. You'd show up early on the Saturday morning. You'd have two rounds of practice, you'd have qualifying, and then during the night you'd have two heat races in a main, and you were done by 11 o'clock. <laughs> the day was a long day, but it was one day, and you were done. <laughs> so it was, a, it was nice for me to have a Sunday off, to be able to be home, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, because I'd spent those previous few years just on the road all the time. Um, so it, it, was a, it was a welcome time in my, in my life. Pike's Peak. How did your love affair, and why did your love affair with Pikes Peak start? Well, see, I'm going to go, say that goes right back to the beach buggy days. You know, when I, when I was doing, like, the Mazda RX-3s, I wasn't doing hill climbs with those. That was all about the rally stuff. I'd moved on to the rally stuff. Right. But I used to read about Pikes Peak, even in New Zealand, um, you know, that it was the second oldest race in U.S. history. So 
in in the early what was this um, 79 when we were building our Nissan race car I had Louis Yancer building the engine um, he had a had a race shop in Santa Ana and one day we went out testing in the local mountains and he came out and watched because uh, he'd never built a rally car he used to build all these big V8s for all sorts of racing and that yep. um, so he built me this little four banger you know <laughs> so, so he came out and watched um, as we were sliding it up the road and he goes Phew, you need to be go to Pikes Peak he said I used to race here years ago and he said these cars would look good and I said well I've already contacted those guys and they, they said no they only run open wheel and stock car oh he says let me give them a call so anyway he gave them a call it took a year for them to come back to me um, might have even been two and they said you know what um, we're considering the rally class at Pikes Peak. Can you come out and give us a demonstration? So uh, I was coming back from a rally in, in Pennsylvania and we, we called in, met their, their board of governors and that early in the morning. And so we went up on the mountain. Uh, Pikes Peak becomes a toll road at nine o'clock every day. But you know, between six and nine, you can use the road for any, any private testing, which I didn't really know much about it then. Um, so <clears throat> one of the officials jumped in the car with me. They said, well, just run halfway mm -hmm. and, you know, we'd, we'd like to see how these rally cars are on, on this road. Of course, all gravel road, nice big wide road, perfect for a rally car, perfect for a rally driver, you know, <laughs> nice and slippery and you just flow the car through the Easy corners. Easy to read. Easy to read. I'd never been up it. So we did a run to the halfway point and came down and everybody's shaking their heads, they said, that was great. And they said the time, which I didn't know I was being timed at the time, put you in the middle of the stock car pack for qualifying on your first run. <laughs> so they said, we are now gonna like to invite the rally class for Pikes Peak. So it was pretty cool that I was sort of part of all that well, initiation. You, you got the boys there, didn't you? Yeah, that, that got that going there. So interesting enough, all throughout the, you know, the pretty much all throughout the 80s, um, that was never part of my rally contract, but I decided I wanted to go and do that event. So um, I'd, I'd take my kids and that, and off we would go there, and we would do that event every, every year. Earlier on, we had um, Graham Crosby in the studio, and, and we were talking to Graham about, I suppose you'd say, the motorcyclist, Holy Grail, the Isle of Man. For you, Pikes Peak is like that for you. It's, it's the Holy Grail, isn't it? What makes it so special? You know, I think, I think the uniqueness was, um, it was sort of man and the machine, not man and the rule book. Okay. The rules were the safety rules, mm -hmm. which was one page, and it was the rally class, the second paragraph. <laughs> Um, you know, you roll cages and harnesses and things like that. Um, so once again, it was attractive to me because now you can freely build something, build a machine to go as fast as you want. The limitation was traction because it was a gravel road. So um, You knew about that because you'd been playing around with four-wheel drive. We'd been playing around with four-wheel drive. You know, the, the first time we went there, of course, the, the first couple of years was a two-wheel drive car, but that was, that was okay. Um, and then along came our four-wheel drive, and then that that car got a turbocharged engine, and, and you know, so it just went on and on and on. And uh, I knew we would sit down, you know, at the workshop and figure out what's it going to take you know, to, to try to win this event. You know, the Europeans started recognizing it, the Peugeot team would come, the Audi team would come, um, you know, and, and uh, everybody from Michelle Mouton to Walter Rawl and Ari Vartanen, you know, you were Kanken and all these guys had all been racing there and the, the teams were spending lots and lots of money. Yet we would still say, well, what's it gonna take to beat those guys? Um, you know, so it was, it was during um, my Mickey Thompson off-road racing, I, I, was, I was driving for the Mazda team and never doing a full season, but nearly winning the championship only by doing two-thirds of the, the rounds that I got asked to drive for Toyota. Um, rally was still my passion, so I, I ended up turning them down. They hired Robbie Gordon and then 
Then the following year, they asked me again. I still couldn't do it. I still was doing Asia Pacific. So I ended up doing a few events with the Ford team on the Mickey Thompson series, sharing the drive with Robbie Gordon. And then in the third year, they, they said, OK, last chance. You're going to come and drive for us. I said, yep, I'll drive for you. <laughs> so pretty interesting year. I, I, was, I did the Asia Pacific series for Mazda the off-road stadium series for Toyota. Um, so we were able to make sure that, you know, I had the right bags and right clothing to wear, <laughs> you know, different markets, so that was all fine. Um, but it was during that year that the, um, the IMSA series was changing. They'd been running the four-cylinder turbocharged engines with yep. Dan Gurney, and, and that, that series was wrapping up and, and uh, TRD, Toyota Racing Development, had 50 of those engines left over. Ooh. And they, they came to me and said, you know what? What do you think about Pikes Peak? We can make the engines available. And, you know, in qualifying trim, these things are over 1,000 horsepower. So... I bet you that <coughs> made your eyes light up. And so they said, you know, from what we can see, you know, you understand the dirt. You know, I'd, been, I'd won the stadium series three years in a row. Mm. Um, and, and uh, so they knew I understood that side of it. They knew my experience at Pikes Peak. You know, we were building our own four-wheel drive cars and they could provide an engine. Um, so once again, we sat down at the workshop and said, you know, what do we need to do to try to win Pikes Peak? So um, we knew we had all those major elements, um, the engine, the four-wheel drive system and, and that. We said, what we don't have, though, is aerodynamics. <coughs> and uh, we feel, and my chief engineer said, you know, I think we really want to have a shot at getting an aero package on this car, which nobody really had an experience on a dirt road. Mm. So we, um, we hired a, a well-known IndyCar driver, uh, designer, Lee Dykstra. Um, he'd, he'd built quite a few Indy cars had a lot of experience, even at Pikes Peak as well, um, um, in open wheel cars. And um, he also had a, a professor from San Diego University who was an aer aeronautical guy. Mm -hmm. So he had all the aero knowledge. So between all the engineers working together, they, they designed a machine that, that, you know, based around the Toyota Salica frame body style, which was an all carbon body. It was, you know, there was nothing really Toyota left in it. Um, and we went and tested it. We, we went to um, El Mirage Dry Lake. We you know in those days we didn't have the funding to build a model to do all the scale testing and everything and that. Um, so we built the full style car and we took it to El Mirage Dry Lake just up in the, in the high desert out of LA. And we did lots of passes at 100 miles an hour and changing the car and measuring downforce. And <coughs> It was pretty spectacular in terms of the numbers. At, at 100 miles per hour, it created 2,000 pounds of downforce. And so with lots of instrumentation on all the suspension points and, you know, the team all had their, even in those days, this is 94, they had all their laptops up there measuring everything, um, which, you know, the car weighed 2,000 pounds. So for all intents and purposes, you know, it could drive on the ceiling upside down, it could suck itself up. And this was still a dirt car. So, you know, this much ground clearance, which we knew being Pikes Peak was so, so smooth, we could afford to run it, you know, down low. We spent days early in the morning because the wind would come up and all our data would go, go bad. We days testing early in the morning to find out what we needed to do to change the center of pressure. You know, we knew we could get downforce, but now we wanted to balance it. So we did it all in a straight line. Mm -hmm. And so we could move the center of pressure on the car once again, I just loved working with the engineers, you know, and learning. You know, I, I was now just a driver, but I was just learning something. Whole area of, of expertise I'd never been, you know, exposed to before. Um, so out of it all came, came down, they said, okay, we've got all this downforce now. We've got the horsepower, we've got the traction. B.F. Goodrich came on board, and they built me a special tire. Um, and uh, <clears throat> they said, but now you can't drive it the way you used to drive. You can't drive it like a rally car. 
the, the way the aero is going to work on this car is we know you're going to slide a little bit through the corners, but anything more than 15 degrees thereabouts, and you're going to start losing downforce. So you've got to be very neat and tidy and keep the car as straight as possible because the air coming underneath, if you get it on a big slip angle, it's just not going to load the Venturis underneath, which provided the, the downforce to the center of the car. Then we rented the mountain, off we went to the mountain there several weeks before the race. And once again, we would test every morning and uh, lots of different tires and testing and, and just collecting lots of data. And it was, it was fabulous for me as a driver. I could just come down um, at the end of a test run and just tell the, uh, tell the team, you know, what was happening at slow speed, high speed and everything. And they had all that data from all the dry lake testing of what to do to make the changes. And it turned out what I wanted, I wanted the car to rotate like my, like my rally car on the hairpin corners. I could flick it in there and rotate it around, which they said, it's okay, because low speed, you're not going to get any downforce at any rate. <laughs> but then on the high stuff, they said, it's got to be straight. So it turned out I'd wanted oversteering on the slow speed corners and then on the high speed corners I wanted understeering. So that way it would just keep it And they could give, that, they could give that car to you? And they did. They finally got me set up like that. And you could say visually watching that car was a bit boring to watch, but um, come race day we took 39 seconds off Ari Bartman's record and that record stood for 13 years. And it was only broken when the road became paved. So um, it's a fun time. So, you know, you asked me about Pikes Peak. Yes, it was a special place that um, we were able to push all our knotted experience of all our racing our programs that we'd done for years and perhaps put all that into that one particular event. You know, the second oldest race in US history. It's been around for over 100 years now. Um, and build a machine and test and develop it and drive it and and do something special. It's funny, you, uh, I just picked up on, on listening to you here, you use the word we built a machine, you don't say we built a car. No, it is a machine. You know, it's all mechanical componentry and all that, you know, it's the aero stuff, it's the motors, the drive lines, the transmissions, you know, springing, the weight balance, you know, roll centers and, you know, Roll stiffnesses front and rear, it's just, it is a machine. <laughs> By that stage, you've pretty much come a long way from the beach buggy, that's for sure. Yeah. And then Toyota came along to you and they said, we want you to do Pike's Peak in a ute. Pretty much, didn't they? Hey, the, the, mm. the Tundra. No, it was actually Tacoma. Oh, Tacoma, was it? Tacoma, yeah. So how did, how did that make you feel? It's like, oh, I've got this state-of-the-art machine here and now you want me to do it in a ute. Well, you know, so what, what it was, we'd won it three times, four times, with the Celica. And the Celica was no longer, uh, the four-wheel drive car was no longer being sold in the U.S. market. Right. But small trucks, the Tacoma truck was, and they said, yep. you know, we, we, we need to change the focus um, to, to get, you know, the truck guys would like to get behind that as well. So... We got, we got our artists to do some renderings of what the Pikes Peak truck would look like. And it was a bit of a stretch, and, but it did say Tacoma on the top of the windshield. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, here it was, this truck that was exactly the same height as Salica, and we took everything that we learned off that Salica in terms of all the aero shapes and everything else and put the Tacoma badge on the top of it. <laughs> it was totally different, you know, it, it, it was a rear engine now. It was another 10% lighter. It was a chassis that was you know, like a little formula car now. Yep. Um, it had much better suspension. Yes, there was a lot that we'd learned from the Salica that we could apply to the Tacoma. Um, and we built that truck. And uh, sadly, it, it came within half a second of the Salica time. It should have been faster. The road conditions were never you know, being a dirt road, the, the, the correct amount of moisture content in the road mm -hmm. was critical for traction. And every time we raced it there, it was the road was slippery and it was just hard, hard work. Um, so it never actually beat the Salica, but it, it was faster. So, um, 1991, the US Marine Corps came knocking on your door. Mm. How did that make you feel? That's, 
you know, that's a long way from Morangi Bay to have the US Marine Corps knocking on your door. We were busy doing Asia Pacific and Pikes Peak and yeah, 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 I'm sure there were some others. Oh, we're doing some concept cars and that as well. The, the, the company was growing. You were doing the entertainment side of it. Though. Yeah, yeah, the company was growing and it didn't sound that interesting. And But then when they said, no, you guys are well suited, you know, we've looked at, you know, other other organizations that where their experience lies we've, we've gone to some of the off-road teams and they build v8 trucks that go really fast through the desert and you guys do rally cars and trucks and perhaps you under, have an understanding of all this stuff and so we want to come to you with a vehicle that hasn't been built yet and work with your engineers to help design a, a vehicle that has much more mobility than what they currently have is going to fit inside the the uh, the CH forty six Osprey helicopter, um, and then the the V twenty two the vertical takeoff aircraft. Um, so it's a narrow vehicle, um, but we being it's just a narrow smaller vehicle. We we want to see where we can push the limit for off road mobi mobility. You know we have our Hummers here. And you know, there's a, lots of things we love about the Hummer, but it's not great off-road. But it's got good ground clearance. It's, it, they showed us all the good things, and and so they tasked us with, you know, come up with an idea, come up with a concept of what what we can do. So we listened, and once again, reflecting on it, looking back on it, we built this vehicle, and started um, working with some of the different user groups and within the Marine Corps, and getting their feedback and. Then we started quickly learning about mm -hmm. what we could do better, you know, because now we got exposed to what they wanted. They said, "Yeah, this is good. That's bad. This is good," and, you know. And so then we went and built them three more vehicles. No, we built we built a hybrid electric vehicle for them because that's what they wanted. And, yeah, this is back in mm. yeah 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 ninety five. So all, yeah. so lead acid batteries, not you know low tech there, but it wasn't all about the, the the batteries. It was about the silent watch and silent mobility and things like that, and exploring you know the combination of a hybrid system and so on. Um, and then we built them three more other vehicles because you know they shared with us you know some of their challenges um, on missions and that and of of um, logistics of the Humvee of spare parts and all that sort of stuff. You know, they gave us one example. They said, for the Humvee, each corner of that vehicle has a different length drive shaft. So our inventory for spare parts when we go on a mission <laughs> is huge. So we said, okay, let's design you a corner, a complete corner, the shock, the A-arms, everything, that fits on all four corners. It can be configured so it fits on all four corners, including the half shafts. Some front differential is the same as the back differential. All these things, and it's got twice the suspension travel, and it still fits inside that narrow aircraft or helicopter. Um, so that became really fun for us and our customer. So then we got exposed to other customers. Lockheed Martin um, was suggested we chat and. Um, through through the armed forces and we talked together and uh, um, those folks had a lot of experience in you know not only aircraft but weapon systems and so on but no experience on ground vehicles um, so we started working on some some of the unmanned vehicles that was you know a pretty hot topic at the, at that time which eventually ev um, evolved to the autonomous vehicles as well they had all those skill sets to do the autonomous you know, controls, and we were going to be the vehicle guys. And then, you know, and as you sit around, and th this was all exploratory, one-off prototypes, you know, where we were trying to find out what could be done, what was possible, um, and what wasn't. You know, the goal was always to travel over a bigger percentage of the planet than what they'd been able to in the past. And some of it was silent watch, um, you know, different size vehicles, you know, especially when you take a man out of the system, a man out of the vehicle, you know, you totally design that vehicle different now. Um, 
And can it run, that vehicle, can it roll over and continue on? Can it run upside down? You know, we did one of those as well. So, you know, things like that. We had articulating wheels and stuff like that. Very, very interesting. So, as you can imagine, as we got exposed to those programs, our engineering team, you know, started really growing. So we had several PhD guys and you know, a lot of good, really good mechanical and electrical engineers because every one of them had an electrical component to it, often a hybrid component to it as well. And we had articulating arms with wheels on the ends with electric motors driving them. And, uh, it was it's a long, long, long <laughs> yeah. way away from, from an RX3 rally car, really. Yeah, a long way, a long, long way. Okay. okay, let's, again, take a little bit of a turn. Your business is obviously going very, very well, and you're doing these amazing, interesting projects, which, you know, every morning you must have woken up and thought, I can't wait to get to work. To exactly, see what's, you know, exactly. What's ahead of me. Now let's go back a little bit and let's say, well, okay, at this stage, your two oldest sons are in the States, and they're yep. both racing, and you actually, you're racing now is perhaps not as serious, you're racing against your sons. How does that feel? It, it was fun and you know so the, the boys grew up tagging along with me throughout my racing career and all that so you know they couldn't help but fall into the you know that lifestyle and, <laughs> and desire and, and challenge so um, you know so then, then before we knew it we were, were you know we were doing things like the Baja 1000 we'd be racing against each other and some of the stories you know that we would tell over the Thanksgiving, which was always the following weekend, some of the things that I could reveal to them what happened that they didn't even know was going on during the <laughs> event, just from experience over the, over the years and all that. It was good stuff. And so, yeah, we, we you know, I was very, very fortunate that um, um, we, we had those times. And, and, you know, not only just the racing side of it, but then the pre-running and, and, you know, then, then all their other motorsports, their rally efforts and all that, you know, their offered efforts, you know, once again, they've, they've stayed in the dirt. They've, they've found that the most interesting. Ryan, my middle son, started out in the Formula Ford stuff and all that, and he, he'd always told me, he says, nah, Dad, I'm going to just stay on the blacktop until I took him down to Mexico once, and we, we did a pre-run for about three days for the upcoming Baja 1000 and he got to drive there and I started to show him how different you drive in the desert compared to circuit racing and um, um, he just came back after three days he says this is fantastic this is what I really want to do a big part of it again was the adventure right. you know the adventure of where you went to you know we were overnight in some great little seaside village or something down in, down in Baja there and, and uh, it's remote as anything and um, I don't know, it's just very cool and uh, um, very different to going to a circuit track where you'd go round and round and round. Um, it, you know, not that that's bad, but it just wasn't something that we all enjoyed as much as what we did with our, our adventure type of motorsports. Okay, we're pretty much close to the end here, Rob, but Tell me about the festival. Well, I suppose, tell me about how, how you obviously love the place. Yep. And you've built this very special driveway and now you run the Leadfoot Festival. How did that start? And tell me all about the festival and tell everybody out there all about your Leadfoot Festival. A little bit about how hey as a little kid, I'm going to say eight years old, so that's what, 59? Um, my parents would take us down there to my great aunt and uncle who had one of the six little batches on Hahai Beach. Um, no electricity, you know, gas lanterns, and as an eight-year-old kid, this was fantastic. You know, this was camping in a little shack on the beach and, you know, we would go out fishing, you know, we would, we would no refrigeration, so we'd catch the fish, we'd cook the fish, the crayfish, the same thing, and everything. It was just, it was just fond, fond memories. Um, you know, when I when I met my wife and I took her down to brought her down to New Zealand the first time, she said, "Oh, take me somewhere that you've got great memories." I go, "Oh yeah, okay, <laughs> let's go down the high." <laughs> well, anyway, cut a long story short, we um, the second time we came down, she said, "Oh, um, we're going to Hahe, and I've booked us a place to stay." And um, it was right along the coastline, it was 35 acres, and she said, this place is for sale. So, um, 
any rate, we bought it, and that was perhaps the first step. So <clears throat> going back, a, you know, a decade or two beyond that, and all my rally days and all that, you know, we raced on, you know, especially in New Zealand, we raced on some of the most wonderful backcountry roads, and, and in other parts of the world and that as well. And, you know, I always just said, you know, when I, when I retire, here's how it's gonna be. We're, I'm gonna have this house, and the house is going to be nice, but the road, the driveway is going to have bits and pieces of all the roads I love. And honey, when I come home from work, you know, you're going to meet me at the, at the gate with a beer and I'm going to drive up the road. You might even have my helmet and gloves there and all that as well, fast up to the house. Maybe I have the beer when I get to the house. Yeah, I forget, something like that. And this is what I'd love to have. We would just joke about it, you know, so... Um, in the early 2000s, I got a call or a letter from Lord March. He says, Goodwood Festival, you know, we'd love you to bring your Pikes Peak car there. You know, this is a hill climb as well. And uh, so Salica had been retired then. Um, so we were still running the Tacoma. And so off we did. We shipped that over there and, and ran Goodwood in, I think it was 2001. Um, set fastest time. And... Uh, Still on the dirt tires, <laughs> but that was fine. <laughs> um, and, and I came away from there, I said, Shelley, so that, that house we're gonna build, <laughs> you know, with the driveway, <laughs> it's gonna be a little bit like Goodwood, except it's gonna be twistier. Goodwood's a bit straight, you know. <laughs> we need to make some hairpins. So, so we'd already bought the first part of the property, the 35 acres. I said, you know what, if we buy the next part, that's 25 acres, and then if I can get down another 50 acres, then off the next farm, then we can get to the highway. And there's a real steep area that I can do a whole lot of switchbacks there, which will be my little bit of Pikes Peak. And then we'll have a tree section there that's a little bit like your traditional forest rally. And um, we're gonna do our own event in New Zealand, opposite, modeled after Goodwood, but in the opposite time of the year and in the opposite part of the world. So um, we set about doing it. Right about that time, or just after we decided to do it, I already had the gravel road built. We had all the, the land purchased and that. So we had six different pieces we had to get to make <laughs> the original 35 acres good enough. <laughs> so it's now is 150 acres. Um, and uh, along came a political change in, in the US scene, which I could see was going to be um, quite detrimental to our business, certainly all our defense business, um, which, you know, I decided that um, I had an offer from one of our customers, uh, Textron, to acquire us, and I'd been pushing them back for over a year. Uh, we were still doing lots of work for them. Um, and, but they knew our business well. They, they often had their, their people in our, in our business every day as we worked on different projects with them. And, um, and as I saw this whole political change in, in, in the U.S. defense system and so on, uh, you know, Shelley and I said one night, you know, don't want to sell because I absolutely love the business. I love all the people that we've surrounded ourselves and all, all their creativity and all the different, we were 20 something different programs we were working on, you know, including, you know, Disney stuff and so on. Um, I said, but you know what, if things change the, the way we think they're going to change, you know, that's going to be huge impact to the company. I think we should take the offer we have and maybe go into a different part of our lives. And we did. So, uh, so they, that forced me then, not forced me, but that they'd said to myself, you know, now maybe we can do this hill climb in New Zealand. And that's what we'll call retirement. And, and that's where the Leadfoot Festival was born. Okay. There'll be viewers out there that don't know much about it. What is the Leadfoot Festival? What can they expect when they turn up in Hahe? Leadfoot Festival is, is um, having all different disciplines of motorsport all at one event. Okay. We, we, we're never going to do a 500 mile race. It's, it's a hill climb. Right. So we're going to be one pass up the hill for each car, you know, in succession. 
Um, we're going to have old formula cars, we're going to have off-road cars, we're going to have drifting cars, we're going to have rally cars, um, you know, circuit racing cars. And, and the whole goal is to have significantly important vehicles and the drivers, or we try to match up well-known drivers and put them in other cars and that as well. So it's a chance to see these different unique vehicles. Some of them are outlawed and, 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 and don't race anymore. Um, or can't find a series to race in. But you know, um, as, as we've heard with, there's, there's a lot of New Zealand guys and guys all around the world that collect these old cars. They're Indeed. passionate about these cars. Indeed. And you know, they can bring them to an event like Leadfoot and they'll only race them six miles all weekend. But you know, they get a chance to run them at speed and, and our guests that come to the event It'll, it'll remind them of times gone by, you know, the sights and sounds and smells and all that of these old cars and, and what it was like and, you know, bringing back some of that, that history of motorsports that, you know, isn't out there in, in a current motorsport event right now. N not to say that that's wrong or anything, but this is a, a celebration of a lot of the old guys and girls and, um, and the old machinery in that as well. Rob Millen, you've been a fantastic guest um, here on Legends, so thank you very much for your time. Good luck with your new ventures, and um, if you've got a chance, fellas, get down to Leadfoot. Yes, it's uh, February 8th and 9th, um, 2020. Thank you very much, Rod. Thanks okay. for your time. Thank you.